Hello, welcome. Hello, Yoshi. Welcome, Shay. It's great to have you. We're going to begin in just a few moments. If you would like, you're more than welcome to um, yeah, turn your videos on. We, we, we're going to have people on, on mute just for now, but you're welcome to turn your video so we can see you. And uh, feel free to put into the chat box. Uh, you can send it. It goes to me, I believe. You're welcome to say hello and where you're dialing in from. Shay, it looks beautiful wherever you are. Tell us where you are. And Yoshi, where are you calling in from? You know, we just have it in uh, music, sort of try and keep bandwidth a little bit. Uh, <laughs> my phone here. Where, whereabouts in the world are you today? Yoshi and Shay. I'd love to hear. Ah, wonderful. So Shay's calling in from Muskogee Creek Territory, Birmingham, Alabama. Yoshi, North Carolina, where in North Carolina? I lived in North Carolina uh, for many years, actually, and uh, loved, loved, loved it. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome, everyone. And Sarah, um, as we're getting started, those just joining us, welcome, Jenny. Feel free, everyone, you can turn your videos on. We're going to keep the everyone muted for now, uh, but feel free to put into the chat box just a hello where you're calling in from, um, and I'll, uh, I'll do my best to sort of relay that. So we've got North Carolina represented, we've got Alabama, the Muskoka Creek Territory, and feel free to share whereabouts you are dialing in from. So we want to be mindful of everyone's time and so want to welcome everyone who's joining us live and those of us who are joining us um, perhaps uh, a little bit later on while this is being recorded and welcome Sophia. We're so grateful to have everyone here and Sarah dialing in from Malaysia. So it is early, like kind of like early, super early. Got it, Sarah. Yes, early. I was like super late. No, super early in Malaysia, 5 a.m. Sarah, hats off to you, my friend. I uh, hope you've got some good tea or strong coffee over there. Uh, wonderful, Jenny from Santa Cruz County. Wonderful. And Yoshi Pai, no shores. Wonderful. Well, welcome, everyone. We are so honored um, that you have joined us today. And again, welcome those joining us live and those joining us um, recorded. My name is Belinda Chu, and I'm here um, with my fellow uh, um, panelists, um, Samira uh, Chatila, Sarang Yankee, and Dr. Elizabeth Sumita Paman. And each of us will be doing um, our own respective introductions um, to this panel. We're very honored, and thank you so much to Six Seconds for um, inviting this, uh, this panel to share voices on recentering indigeneity in ecology and emotional intelligence. Um, and so uh, I am calling in from the Upper Valley um, in New Hampshire, right uh, in the White Mountains um, and in between sort of the Green Mountains um, and on the unceded territories of the Abenaki uh, people. And so grateful, of course, to be um, on the land in which I am able to, uh, to do the session today. Welcome everyone, those just joining, feel free to put in the chat box um, and share with us where you are dialing in from. Um, and just to sort of, again, to sort of uh, situate us, really what we're chatting about today um, is really to recenter these voices. And we're going to be really rooted and grounded in the Hamez uh, principles on democracy on um, democratic organizations, as many of us are now familiar with. But really what we are chatting about this panel um, is thinking about how do we recenter and recentering is an additive word. It does not mean that we are cutting anybody out. In fact, we are adding, we are returning voices and expanding our understanding of systems of the different systems of ways of knowing and different system ways and ways of being. And how do we sort of raise questions? And today we're probably gonna raise more questions if anything else, but the hope here is to stir the curiosities in each of us, whether we are working for the UN or we're the hedge of a, head of a hedge fund, or maybe we're an eight-year-old climate you know, uh, justice warrior ready to, ready to do something. 
Um, what we're going to be really talking about today is move beyond even um, being aware of our emotions and think about how do we act? How do each of us really sort of take our part and again, recentering and returning and expanding the different voices. Earth Day 2021, it's all about restoring, right? It's all about restoring and healing. And that's here um, what we're going to be talking about today. We won't have time. We'll just, uh, you know, in, 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 in the spirit of full disclosure, we won't have time to do every topic justice. Um, but what we are hoping to do is really raise, uh, you know, the uh, importance of how interconnected um, our ways of being and doing, in fact, are, whether it's, um, you know, when we talk about ecological restoration, as we've, you know, had a full day now of wonderful retreat sessions, right, the education, economy, um, uh, health, land, language, uh, AI, spirituality, it's so interconnected. So we want to hear more voices. We're excited to be on this journey with everyone here. So in that spirit of sharing, um, we're, we'd love to begin with story. We always like to begin with story. And so we'd like to invite each of um, my fellow panelists to share a little bit more uh, about story. And we have a few photos uh, for everyone just to sort of, again, situate uh, and contextualize where we are calling in from and a little bit about our story. So. Uh, Ellie, Dr. Sumiro Kwaman, would you like to introduce yourself? I am to question Kichi's Tuku Junakuna, Noka Eli Sumiro Waman Sutini, Mamai Wankayo Manta, Taita Kapo Manta, Kunan, Sumak Punchao, Ancha Kusiska, Kashani, Kaipi, Kankuna Wan, Riki, Sulpai, Urbi ay sa ko ay Belinda, yun yun Belinda, yun yun Samira, yun yun Sari. My name is Elizabeth Sumida Waman. I am Wanka and Quechua from the central region of Peru. I call three territories the place where I have my origins on my mother's side. They are for any of you who have traveled to that area. Uh, the regions of Cusco, the region of Junin, and the region of Huancavelica. My grandfather uh, is, that's where we get the Quechua side from. Um, his family was from Huancavelica and also from Cusco, and I'm fortunate to still have family in those areas. And then my grandmother's side, who is Huanca, and I'm referring to different varieties of Quechua people, um, my grandmother's side is from the region of Junin, and specifically a place called the Montaro Valley. Um, and a community um, in Quechua known as Hatun Shonko, which means brave heart, uh, as well as Waman Marca, which is the place of the falcons. Um, and so these are the places that I, I find myself um, consistently uh, returning to in many ways, uh, not just physically, but also spiritually when I pray, and then also um, emotionally when I think about places of refuge, places of safety, places of goodness. Um, and uh, on my father's side, uh, he is Japanese. He is from the region of Nagoya, specifically from Inazawa. Um, and I feel very uh, blessed to uh, have been raised in uh, two distinct uh, cultural practices and, and communities. Um, but at the same time, um, as we kind of will get into, I think a little bit deeper, uh, that is the confluence that is identity these days. Um, and I think it's a very good thing. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, begin with this photo, actually. This is an image um, that was taken. I teach at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities campus in Minneapolis. And um, every course that I teach, uh, specifically in the College of Education, focusing on international and comparative education, um, indigenous education, and indigenous research courses, I like to do experiential work with my students who are primarily um, masters and doctoral students. And we had the sincere pleasure, honor, uh, privilege of uh, being taken to uh, this place. This is Coldwater Spring um, in the city of Minneapolis, right in the city. Um, it is run by the National Park Service, but uh, we were taken to this place by a dear friend and colleague 
um, Darlene St. Clair and her native name is Ikeyapiwi. And she is from the Lower Sioux Indian community, which is Dakota territories, Dakota lands. Um, and the University of Minnesota sits on unceded Dakota territories. So calling in from Minneapolis, this is Dakota land, um, part of the Ocheti Shakowin peoples across Minnesota, North Dakota and South Dakota. And um, this area to me symbolizes a lot of what I think we're going to cover today um, from our respective lenses, of course, and different geographies, but maybe at the heart or the core of what it is that we have to say um, about our connectivity to each other, our connectivity and reconnectivity to place um, and to ways of honoring these places. So this beautiful location is a spring and um, it is considered a sacred place to the Dakota peoples, a very important place to their origin um, in indigenous cultures around the world, certainly for Quechua peoples, Wanka peoples, springs are um, really, really sacred. Um, they are viewed as sacred because the water, the origination of the water, yes, we can scientifically think about this and derive that kind of information. However, the spirit and the energy of the water and what it signifies, not just um, not just hydrologically, not just in terms of um, you know, environment as we might think of it in generic terms, but the way in which we think of water as life and birth um, and generation and regeneration is really important for us. So beginning with this image of um, calling in from where I am and the ways in which um, this spring uh, for Quechua peoples would symbolize uh, the storytelling of our um, emergence as humans from the other world. Um, and for Quechua peoples, for Wanka peoples, um, of course, we're talking about Uruchumpi and Atai Kapia, who are first man and first woman who are called forth um, from the spring. Um, and so, uh, and, and in these places, um, there are some amazing, um, now we see natural sciences and other peoples talking about um, those places, but uh, we see the keepers of those areas as well, such as the frogs and other, other animals. Um, and I also wanted to talk just a little bit, well, not talk as much, but just to share some of the places of origins and, and significance to me as well. So this is where I call home. So this is, um, Kunin, this is the Mantar Valley, the, the community of Hatun Shunko in the lower left-hand corner. And then um, this is the South Valley of Cusco. Um, and uh, then the city of Cusco. Folks who have traveled to the city of Cusco might recognize the Santo Domingo Chapel or, or church, which was um, which is known actually in the Quechua language as Oricancha, um, the place where the gold is, the gold is held or the area of the gold. Um, and uh, I think two things about this. One is, yes, this is places of origination, origin, um, places where indigenous peoples have crafted um, generations of, of being, but they're also places that um, were hit very hard by colonization. And we can see the confluence of that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you for sharing. Sari, would you like to share a little bit about your story? Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's absolutely an honor and privilege to be here to have this discourse uh, and uh, just to be able to connect with everyone on this platform. My name is Sering Anki. The land I'm standing on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by tre Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I think talking about a bit about my story, I think what uh, Ellie spoke about is extremely poetic just in terms of talking about the from originations to where she is as of today. For me, I think I'm going to just take a little bit of a different turn just in terms of talking about my story. It's, Going on 17 plus years of professional experience in management and finance, 
currently for a large real estate asset management and development company focused on impact and sustainability, educated in finance and economics, born a Tibetan refugee with lived experience in seeing the impact of climate change in my country of origin, Tibet. Little known, but we do refer to it to as the world's third pole. Rooted in the Nalanda tradition that was introduced to Tibet in the eighth century. Yes, we will be talking about things that go really far back. So the eighth century is where I'm going to take you to through this journey as we talk about it. And really the Nalanda tradition is really rooted in and underscored by reason, logic and pluralism. And these are the words I think you would hear about, about pluralism, about discourse, about different, different, uh, different concepts and theories. I grew up in a Tibetan refugee settlement in Tibet in Southern India. Reflecting about our times now, uh, I now realize it must have been materially tough for my parents to be honest, but all I remember was joy. The bounty we received from my mother, oh, we call Amla in, in Tibetan, my mother's vegetable garden. A sense of responsibility as my mother made me tutor at the age of 10 or 11, our neighbors in the local villages or a kinship as I took care of stray cats in the community. That was my joy. And very early on, I was grounded in three concepts, sentient beings. Our prayers as, as a young child were always, not just for ourselves or family or other human beings, but for every being. That was the first concept of sentient beings that I learned. The second concept was interdependence as a fundamental law of nature. We are all equally important and valuable, people and planet. Our very existence, survivability and prosperity requiring cooperation based on the recognition of the interconnectedness, therefore our need to increase our experience of kinship, especially during these times of social justice that are coming up like being able to connect with, our, with each other because of our sense of kinship and commonality as we're all humans. The third was impermanence. We are blessed with this precious life. My mother, Amla, as I call her, would say, and still reminds me to this day when I call her every weekend, she's like, you have this precious human life. What are you choosing to do today? What are you doing today at this very moment? With this sense of responsibility, gratitude, reciprocity, understanding of the preciousness but fragility of the very nature of our human life, it instills in us with both a sense of great humility, but also courage to realize we each have the power to transform ourselves, starting with our minds, our common present and future when we deal with social justice as well as climate change issues. To be honest, I guess I could share it with you. I'm still learning and trying to intentionally apply each day with every thought, action, and words, these basic concepts. It's simple, it's basic, but it takes intentionality of making sure that with every action and word, we're able to realize it and act upon it. I think Dr. Chu, that would fairly sum up how my values, education, and profession intersects with climate justice and climate of emotions. I think some of the pictures here that I've shared is, you would see the wind house, it's, it's prayer flags, the beauty of it, but it's really about recognizing the wind as a powerful story. The other two photos that you would see has been shared is, it's the settlement that I grew up in, in, in Southern India. It's called Dogaling, which means the wish fulfilling settlement. And gradually, we will speak more about, uh, about this place and about as to how we will connect the stories back to these photos. Great. Thank you so much, Saring. Boy, I wish we could spend several hours <laughs> with each person here. Samira, please introduce yourself. Sure. Marhaba, Jamian. Hello, everyone. My name is Samira Shatila. Uh, I'm joining you from Minnesota, so thanks to Ali for the land acknowledgement statement. We uh, from joining you from the same place. Um, I'm originally from Ras Beirut, Lebanon, and um, this picture is of me next to Sakhret al Raushe, which means the Raushe rock. It's um, it's one of uh, the most celebrated rocks of Beirut area, given that it's no longer really 
um, a green area, and it's never really discussed in light of that. Um, but of course, this is due to many reasons, not because it was never that before. So um, from where I come from, we usually talk about um, who I am now, and then we go back in time. Um, so right now, um, basically, I'm a PhD student in the Comparative and International Development Education Program at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Um, and I'm a fellow at the Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of Global Change. So I have an interdisciplinary background, actually. I have a background in STEM education, uh, medical laboratory sciences, and in sociology. Um, so, um, so that's about who I am now. And I've also worked in research on social, in social sciences and educational um, issues in Lebanon and the Arab world. So um, that's for who I am today. So who I am in terms of my family is separate from who I am here. Um, I come from a Beiruti family and from Ras Beirut. Um, there are a few families from Ras Beirut who continue to live in Ras Beirut today. And my family and I are one of those families. Um, so in thinking about joining this discussion, it's fascinating how I always saw there was a land connection between me as a Beiruti and the Beirut region, but this was never highlighted or discussed much or, or seen in people who either come to Beirut, live in Beirut or visit Beirut, because people would think, oh, let's go to the mountains to see the natural uh, views. Let's go to um, the valleys. But Beirut is never really thought of except of except in light of the sea that surrounds it. But um, in reality is whenever an elderly person from my family talks to me and wants to get to know me, they would tell me, whose daughter are you? And if they didn't know, they tell me, OK, which Shatila are you? Are you from the Snubra, which means from the pine tree, Shatilas? Or are you from the Hamra, which means red Shatilas? And by red, People, that's where I live, actually. I'm from the Hamra Street. People think it's the name of a street, but really red is not because of a color. It, it is the color, but it's not because, oh, it's a um, lively street or anything. It's just simply because we used to grow cactuses and potato over there, and the soil was red. And then it became called the red area. So that was how historically it was. And that's how we know each other. Oh, these are the shatilas of the red. Or, oh, these are the shatilas of the pine trees or whatever. So our uh, connections are tied to um, locations tied to trees and, and how plants were grown in the different regions of Beirut. So um, I will stop my introduction here. And yeah, Belinda, back to you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, everyone. Boy, there's a, a lot of richness here already, and I'm sort of furiously jotting down notes, actually, <laughs> as everyone is talking here. I'm like, oh, right, I'm on my post-it notes, but there's so much here that um, everyone sort of spoke about the sort of confluence, um, you know, wind, water, kinship, and really interesting, Samira, something you just said about how, for many of us, we start where we are and then go back. And interestingly, how we just sort of are looking at the discussion, we all went, the origins, starting with an eighth century, that you took us back to eighth century, and then sort of brought us back sort of to, to where we are today. So, and thinking about this, I mean, I'm going to um, ask you, you this question, because something that Ellie mentioned about, so the confluence of, you know, colonization, modernization, whether we're in the academic field or the real estate field, right? There's there's consumerism, colonialization, capitalism, all of those things. What, if anything, has gotten lost or missing in terms of um, these voices? Like you said, when co someone comes to Beirut, they don't necessarily think about whether the seven families that you know where your where your 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 home is from. What what's what gets lost? What's what's missing? Okay, so um, when so, so I was reading this article the other day, and um, I realized that there's this point about indigenous people where there's a con there's this concept of genocide, where there's this erasure of the indigenous person. Um, I realized that this is actually happening or happened and continues to happen, but not in the uh, sense of um, killing. It's more of a erasure, a multifaceted erasure or rejection. So there is this component where um, 
speaking up for your rights as a Beiruti is equivalent to you being unaccepting of other people. When in fact, um, it's simply being, it's not complaining about the other person or whoever is living in the region, but it's about complaining about why are we being erased? Why are we being shut down? Why are we being left out? And this happens at the level of knowledge systems, language, the way we conduct our residential life, and even being labeled, which is a very classical argument in this context, uncultured, um, in the sense that um, we have no appreciation of beauty because look at what we have done to our homes. So if I scroll on Facebook now, for example, I have many pages that are like romanticizing, oh, the old Beirut, the beautiful Beirut, look at the houses, look at the tiny houses. If I had a house like that, I would never do this to it. But you know, nobody, especially the people who create those houses, wakes up one day and be like, oh, I want to destroy it. And, and, and suddenly you're labeled as, you know, unappreciative of history because there's a lot of historical reference to it. But, you know, there's a different story. There's a backstory behind that. It's not just people waking up and doing that. Um, there's this myth of unappreciative Beirutis and, and, um, and the problem is that we are actually penalized for having it rather than allowed to have it comfortably. So your own land and property is, which is currently worth a lot because the area is turned into a city. Um, but the typical Beiruti, so they can probably have an entire house, but not have any money to spend on themselves. So what they have to do is they have to either sell it um, or change their location. But selling can only take you so far because most of what you own is labeled by the government as a historical site. So what happens is that the sudden ap appreciation of history from the government means that you cannot do anything with the property and you have to sell it at a very, very, very low price. And this is where politicians um, extort and even manipulate those Beirutis and like ask you to sell them for less than a quarter of the original price and you have to be grateful for it. And, and so that's just like one aspect of it. So what people do is sometimes they have to ruin aspects of their houses so that they don't look historical so that they can actually, you know, do something with them. And, um, and, and I know that this is actually tied, it has an emotional aspect of it because I've seen people from my family, they used to kiss the floors and walls before they actually break them and, uh, or take pictures of them. And, you know, because it, it means something to them, but what's seen on the outside is they ruined their houses. They don't care. They're unappreciative of beauty, but that's not true. And that's one. So the language accent, for example, we have comedy shows that literally just mock by the Beiruti accent. We have comedy shows that actually capitalize on that. I'm not saying it's only the Beiruti accent that's being ridiculed because I know that the Southern accent as well is um, made fun of, but the Beiruti character is like there is a fully fledged character and um, they would make fun of it. And even at university when I used to speak in Arabic, um, my friends used to laugh like, oh, you're from Beirut and you speak like that. And then I didn't realize I had a heavier dialect. And then suddenly it became something that I wanted to hide and I would escape it by either avoiding the conversation or shifting to English because in Lebanon, it's normal to shift, fluctuate between English and Arabic and French. So you start hiding it as such and, and even um, the knowledge systems, right? So I, 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 like books I, I remember you I used to seeing books in my house and and those books were simply too precious to be read at home they were put in cabinets and they're not academic enough to be read at academic institutions like schools so these books like exist in like as home decor um, but it took me what a PhD enrollment to realize that oh those are uh, ethnographies or memoirs or um, academic knowledge products that you can actually read and look into so, so that's, I think, what is lost. I mean, some of it, at least, certainly there's more to it, but I, I can stop here. Yeah, wow, no, thank you so much, Samira. Like, I mean, just, again, just a lot of what struck me about what you said was this sort of erasure, right? Erasure of, of voice, erasure, um, and also um, sort of this separation of what is high culture, high academic enough for us to study and those that which are, are, are okay to study, whatever that might be, right? Um, you know, language, knowledge systems, and even this notion of um, 
you know, romanticizing certain things with unintended consequences. Because, right, I don't think any person wakes up and go, how do I ruin somebody, right? I don't think that's most of how we tend to, to hopefully not, um, sort of, uh, you know, conduct ourselves as human beings. So really on that note, I think that was so beautiful that you talked about sort of land and how precious that is and how do we, you know, instead of thinking about dividing and saying, well, you don't appreciate this or X, Y, and Z, inviting back to, again, recentering and expanding those voices to acknowledge that um, how much this richness of the history so they don't go stay, the books don't stay behind the glass. Uh, and so Ellie, I'm curious from your work, um, you know, at, at both uh, the university, but also um, in, in, in your, uh, you know, ancestral homes, land you talked about is so critical, right? The, the land. And I'm curious from your experience, what does it actually, what does it mean to be on the land of the land, right? Some of, many of us, most of us probably here, I, you know, I'm a transplant, you know, to, uh, you know, to New Hampshire. I'm not native to New Hampshire. I'm not, you know, of this land. So what does that mean? Um, and how does, um, no, how does being of the land on the land um, mean in terms of the work, um, the work of ecological restoration? Well, thank you so much, um, Samira. I think uh, I want to say thank you, B, for that question, Belinda, for that question, and then to Samira for her really um, poignant observations regarding um, what is lost. Um, so the connectivity that she began with her introduction, but then what is lost. Um, and so one of the things that I think is really fascinating is, you know, when we talk about indigeneity, um, a lot of times people feel like, you know, there's the mystical native or the ecological native, you know, and that, that, um, that all indigenous peoples are uh, connected to place and knowledgeable of, you know, our cultural practices and our languages. And there certainly are many, many indigenous peoples who are, you know, we're talking about approximately 460 million indigenous peoples, which is still just a drop in the bucket, you know, in a, in a global population that is what, 9 billion and just increasing, um, you know, so uh, 460 million approximately indigenous peoples, you know, in about 90 countries around the world and every single peoples, even amongst Wanka peoples, of whom there are approximately 300,000 Quechua peoples, the estimated number is about 10 million across um, a number, a handful of South American Andean countries. Um, even amongst our communities, uh, we have different ways of understanding our connectivity to place. And what I would say is that indigenous peoples, because we have lived in a place for a very long time, we understand that place in ways that, um, that, that are very relational. So it's really about how do I name this? You know, the, even when Samira talked about, you know, kissing the walls and, and paying your respects to say goodbye to something that you're going to destroy, you're acknowledging the living being of that place. You know, our homes are made of adobe you know, the adobe comes from the earth. They are put together by people who come together in kinship, um, in very profound systems of reciprocity. These systems of reciprocity should not be misunderstood as, you know, I am giving you the same thing that you are then going to return to me. We're talking about really complex systems of reciprocity where there is not a transactional exchange, but it's rather about uh, that that irreplaceable, um, irreplaceable connectivity between entities, between certain entities. So how do I, how do I understand this place where I live, the very dwelling? How, how has it come together in a way that is of the earth and of the connections of the people, the musicians who come to play, you know, the throw that I have where I, where I celebrate by giving something back to the community from the roof of the house, I'm throwing something um, to the community, excuse me you know, um, the dancing that happens and then the ways that we then again cycle through this with different community members and how those traditions are not always there, that sometimes they are like Samira described, 
we have these points of origins and this sort of a compass, um, you know, but, uh, or we have the map in front of us to kind of create sort of a metaphor here, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the map isn't developed and the map isn't muddied by different factors or influences. Being in place also is about, you know, several things in my view. It's about ways of knowing. So uh, really in many ways, we're talking about epistemology and, you know, for folks who uh, are irritated with academics, I apologize, but I do think that there's significant value to that term, you know, which means how do I know what I know? <laughs> what is it that I know? So it's this ways of knowing that uh, indigenous peoples have that's connected to place over a very long time. It's also another academic term, ontology, which is being, you know, my purpose, who am I as a human? Um, the why question, why am I here? Um, you know, and, and so those questions are answered. They are asked and they are continually answered um, through community functions that are done in place and with place and recognition that every tree has a name. Um, every creature that I am in conversation with has a name. I am known to this creature. This creature is known to me. The mountains, the entities, they are viewed as having their own families. Our sacred mountain is Baita Bayana. It means the place where the flowers are picked. And this is a deity. This is one of our apus, our deity, who has a partner and children, all the different ranges. The lakes are known. Um, you know, the stars are known. So the ways in which people build their dwellings, the ways in which they interact with each other, the ways in which we, of course, work the land in order to eat. You know, we don't refer to the, the products of the farm as products. We don't refer to them as commodities. In the Quechua language, they are referred to as that which gives. So already we have an orientation to places is about ways of knowing, it's about ways of being as well. But we also have to take into account and recognition the question that you asked to Samira, which I think is really critical because what does it mean to be indigenous today? And Samira, you know, often gets the question, is she indigenous? But she is not indigenous, but she is not a settler, <laughs> you know? Um, so then how do we come together in order to understand who we are in our places, both being indigenous as well as local? Um, and how do we do this work together? And if I have one more minute, I'll answer, I'll, I'll say very quickly that I think it's really critical for us to establish for this group and for the conversation that in many ways, when we talk about climate change and we talk about climate of emotions and we talk about the ways in which both of these have been uh, assaulted and are limited, you know, uh, that the environment has been assaulted, that the being and the range of being and ways of being and expressing have been assaulted and limited, that we are in many ways referring to empire. We are referring to imperialism, to dominance and and coloniality and the, the way that I understand coloniality, this is put forward by a number of Latin American scholars and indigenous peoples who talk about coloniality, not colonization, not imperialism, but coloniality as four impacts, four domains, control over economy, control over authority, control over knowledge and control over normativity. And when we talk about economy, we're talking about land, labor, when we're talking about authority, we're talking about institutions, the police, the courts, what's happening here in Minneapolis, you know, with the police violence uh, and institutions of justice, other formal institutions, normativity, gender, who says that man and woman only is to be married, that there isn't gender fluid, fluidity, that there are many ways to express and, and to be um, sexual beings. Who says that the nuclear family is the only type of family? Who says what it means to be poor or what it means to be rich? And in terms of knowledge, who gets to decide what is known? <laughs> who gets to regulate and control what is even defined as knowledge, which is what Samita had mentioned with the book example. Thank you, B. No, thank you, Ellie. That's, um, whew, yes, as, as, as we know, this is just the beginning of the dialogue, right? Because I think, you know, 
both of you hit on some really critical pieces here, you know, about, um, you know, I'm just thinking about sort of the reciprocity and that it's not a, you know, insert A and you get out, you know, B and you get C here. That's just sort of not how it works. Kissing the land, you know, tying back to what Sarin said earlier about sentient beings, right? That the adobe, the earth, all of that, you know, holds um, something of, they, they are known to you, Ellie, as you mentioned, they are known to you um, and you are known to them. Right, and really sort of thinking through about sort of what all all of that um, all of that means, um, and and really interesting, you know, you talked about the economy, authority, knowledge, which is um, something for certain that um, Samita had mentioned, and normativity, right? Who gets to sort of determine, and that's really when we're thinking about sort of recentering these voices is also recentering what and, and questioning, right? Really questioning what does it mean? Because when we talk about emotional intelligence you know, oftentimes there's this sort of very nice clean framework about emotional intelligence, knowing what I, what happens to me and, and et cetera. But as we just sort of tap into the, under the surface, there's so much richness to that. So sorry, sort of on, on, on that note, um, kind of building on, on what um, Samira and, and Ellie were, were just mentioning this with place in place, um, you know, who gets to decide. So, you know, just in sort of your work too, whether, you know, it's in your, work work or the the work that you do in, in your your ancestral community um how do we reclaim and 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 reestablish stewardship in you know you're in canada where there is a lot of um you know there's been a lot of discussion about who owns what and who gets to decide how do we what do we do how do we start reclaiming um and reestablishing that I think what Samira spoke about, about loss, uh, Ellie spoke about just in terms of normativity, just in terms of control, reciprocity. And when we think about that, and when we speak about that, and just in terms of the topic about recentering, it's about what we value and what our values are, and how do we recenter it, how we bring it forward, and what is it? And earlier on, I think, well, uh, Belinda, what you spoke about when we, when we initially started the session, um, you mentioned that when we talk about recentering, it's not about exclusion, it's about inclusion, about making the pie broader, just larger. And I think so far what has happened is like voices have been excluded. There has been a hierarchy of knowledge to Ellie's point about what is deemed as not uh, good enough or not valued enough. And so it's really about how do we recenter. And for me, taking that knowledge, taking those conversations and discourses, reclaiming and reestablishing, it's not about, again, exclusion. It's we are recentering. We are talking about value and values and bringing it in to the center and how do we go about doing it? And for me, I, I, I like to, I see things in categories all the time because that's how really how my mind works. So when I talk about reclaiming and establishing a stewardship is through the framework of what is our motivation? What is the intentionality of how you're recentering and why you're recentering? And that really comes from the worldview. Mm -hmm. I think Ellie spoke about the origins, et cetera. It's the worldview. What is our worldview? The worldview of interdependence, about interconnectedness, about people and planet and beings being of equal importance without a hierarchy about being human centered or technology centered, but about people and being all beings being centered. The second component, where we speak about reciprocity, about making sure that we include all our voices is about collaboration. And just to bring about a little bit of a business, a business lingo, it's talking about stakeholder identification, about defining shared values. And that is really what the conversation is moving towards where we are talking about what is our shared values and that's a long-term perspective and long-term view. So far, really, business has been about short-term and 90-day cycles. But when you take the long-term perspective, you have to care about that climate because you're part of it. And in a few years, if you don't take care of it, none of us would be existing any longer. So really about how do we recenter the importance of it. The other aspect that Samira mentioned about the loss of knowledge, and I think that when we frame about reclaiming and, and reestablishing stewardship is about reporting, about documenting, and who documents it. And that's, I think, a key component just about framing ourselves. Um, 
And in terms of how I bring about that framework into what I do is uh, I have the privilege of working as an advisory board for Reimagining Dougaling Tibetan Settlement, RDTS, which is a grassroots organization established in South India in 2012. And that is the refugee settlement that I grew up in and that my, that my father and my parents were part of establishing and creating that sense of community there. And the other example that I wanted to speak about is just about how we bring about that framework in, in with respect to my work work is, uh, as, as uh, Belinda mentioned, that I work for an asset management and development company. And as you know, from a climate change perspective, 40% of the GHG emissions come from real estate. How do we embrace that? The other component that is like when you're talking about land, as, as Belinda mentioned, in Canada, there is a lot of diverse First Nations and Indigenous groups that you have to work in collaboration and in consultation and with respect. So how do you integrate that into, into working through that? And for the one of the a perfect example of my work working in, uh, with respect to how we engage is, uh, we ensure that early on, we take a long-term perspective. We want to ensure that our neighbors who surround our developments that we work with, we engage them. The other component that just in terms of how we ensure that there is inclusivity is uh, one of the master plan community that I'm working on in Ottawa and Gatno is framed under the 10 principles of one planet living framework. And it is uh, the framework was developed by Bioregional and World Wide Life Fund. And it has 10 principles. It ranges from eliminating, eliminating GHG uh, emitting energy sources to encouraging social equity. So that is part of it. One of the principles is it is encouraging happiness. So where would one think about a real estate development that in, embraces all those principles? Talking about my work in, in Dougaling uh, as part of our DTS, it's, uh, again, as I mentioned before, I'm going to make sure that I intersect time and space with this conversation. I have to share two historical moments. In the eighth century, as I mentioned before, the ancient Indian Nalanda tradition of logic, reasoning, analysis, contemplation, and innovation was brought from India to Tibet by Nalanda scholar Shantra Shikta. Following the destruction of the Nalanda University in about, I think, in around 12th century, scholars and teachers fled to Tibet where knowledge was preserved and continued to flourish. In 1959, when Tibet was occupied, India provided refuge and Karnataka state in southern India, where uh, RTTS was formed and established, provided home to many Tibetans. This ancient knowledge of Nalanda, ancient wisdom of compassion and mind training, returned home. Yes, at the loss of Tibet's, uh, of Tibet's uh, status, but it returned home to India and resides in Dogaling, Karnataka state. So it really does inter intersect time, space in so many ways. RTTS in many ways it exemplifies how we were able to reclaim and reestablish stewardship. The Nalanda tradition was preserved through the 8th century till today. And as Ali and Samira have spoken about preservation, recentering, and indigenous local knowledge and documentation, RTTS is motivated to foster the growth of this ancient tradition and knowledge, the center of learning. And it is founded on the worldview of essentiality of compassion and interdependence. And of course, it's aligned with the UN's SDG to become an economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable place for generations. The reason why I wanted to speak about the vision is it recalibrates and it reframes what one should value and what's the center of the framework of that development. It's about essentiality of compassion and interdependence. It is the power and the confidence of what we can contribute. Instead of thinking it as a poor Tibetan refugee settlement, our purpose was we have knowledge, we have wisdom. What can we contribute for the greater good of the world? Recentering our worldview as we define our development activities. I must note here that we cannot discount the equally important value of capital, but it's like how we choose to utilize the capital for what purpose. And economics, along with social, environmental, and local knowledge are equally important. So we cannot discount that. At RGTS, what we do endeavor to do is we wanted to make it in the center of dialogue, discourse, and compassion, and, and finance. 
But with that being said, it does face existential threat of economics, health, and climate change. And this is about tensions. In life, I see history, we see everything is about tensions, but how do we resolve those tensions? How do we address it? And how do we come out stronger and transform ourselves as well as societies that we choose to live in? What we chose to do is, again, as I mentioned, very categorical and very methodical. We took a phased and coordinated approach in how we implemented the plan, master plan. I think I'm getting a cue from Belinda that I must be going talking about a bit too much. <laughs> No, this is fine because we could. I we want we, we wish we could have sort of a lot of time because this, you know, like you said, it's a very coordinated sort of master sort of plan and this thoughtfulness about how do we sort of approach and this, you know, wonderful and and as Ellie mentioned, right? Then what does capital even mean, right? Is it just dollars, right? Or is it also what you're saying too? Is you know we have knowledge and how do we bring that knowledge there and how do we, you know, we talk about the UN SDGs and sort of this sort of very. Um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, in, in a way like, oh, right, the UN SDGs, but it's also a very practical thing. And what do we mean by it? Right, as Ellie, it's economics, health, you know, environment, you know, back to, you know, Samira about sort of just language is, is my Arabic, you know, uh, you know, the accent that I use, all of those bits have, you know, come into play. But a couple of things you said that I think really um, positions us as we only have a few more moments here, but you mentioned this sort of tension, right? There's always this tension. And this importance of also um, the long view, right? We started in the 18th century, probably even before then, um, you know, for this call, but it's the long view. It's eight centuries before us and eight centuries after us, right? Or, or even more than that. So thinking about sort of always holding these tensions and we talk about emotions, we're always in tension of something, right? Whether it's something internally here and externally, what do I do as one individual and in all of these issues? So I'd love to hear from each of you, um, thinking about even the tensions of um, our individual positionality, right? From where we stand, um, from, from all of the different places that we are. Um, and also this importance that everyone here spoke about this. In, we know it's like, it's like, it's not rocket science that we're independent, but it's a lot hard to put into practice. So thinking about that, um, would love to hear from each person, what are one or two things that everyone here on this call and those listening to us what can we actually do to sort of recenter and to, you know these voices and to say yes there is wisdom in all of this let's remove the books from the glass store or the stories that get passed on through the kitchens and through the you know those informal channels of learning and value that into some practical what is something that each of us can can walk away with and so i um, would love to hear from from each person would whoever would from whoever the spirit moves you can go first um, I can go. Um, yes. Okay, so um, so I think the economic aspect is very important, and it came out with both um, Ali and Tsirang, and it's and um, I did not touch upon it a lot because it's a huge issue. Actually, I should have, but um, if if we can, I don't know, Belinda, if you could share the photo yes. of the books, actually. Mm -hmm. So to just talk a bit about books, like for example, there are books that are really informal um, or we can do it later it's okay i got it okay so there are some books that are very informal and that as i told you before they exist just at homes or with families of the people who wrote them so for example the first one is um, i'm gonna read it in arabic and then translate it oh too bad the old days are gone oh the old days of ras beirut and then the other one is Ra'ida in Beirut, Nadia Shatila Daouk, a pioneer from Beirut, Nadia Shatila Daouk. And then the last one to the left is Ra'is Beirut Kama Arifto, Ra'is Beirut as I knew it. And there is a fourth book, uh, uh, or actually campaign, it was called Lakum Hamra Akum Waliya Hamra'i. You have your Hamra, I have my Hamra. Um, all of these books are actually, I got them how? I got them basically by knowing each of the authors. They are relatives and they just passed them on to us and like signed something for my grandfather um, because he was in the Beirut municipality or he was like very active in the community. He was the first dental surgeon in the region and, um, and he was 
he was very much mentioned in those books, but they were written in colloquial Lebanese Arabic and actually Beiruti Arabic, not even Lebanese. And um, so what people can do, what I would do is, for example, now to come think about it, I would um, very much think of putting those books um, or donating them to the library, which does not have any of these books. And I tried to look them up once because I lent one of the books to one of my professors and I was, you know, kind of embarrassed to ask, to ask him to give it back to me. So, um, so then I thought, no, I want it back, actually. Um, so, so yeah, instead of like keeping it somewhere, I'd rather put it at the university library or something so that people can access it and learn about the economic activity of Beirutis. So many Beirutis right now, adults, they don't have the soft skills required to operate and work in Beirut. So now they cannot really work what they used to work in their um, in the previous uh, times, but all of that has been documented in those books. So that's one way where we can actually share knowledge about um, uh, local knowledges and even preserve them for, uh, without imposing them on people, just out there for whoever wants to know more about it. Wonderful, so sort of really, broadening and expanding just that there are these different systems of knowledge, whether they're books. So maybe each of each us can sort of request our libraries to think about um, different authors um, or oral histories, oral traditions, um, because not all, as we know, um, is, is, is written as well. Um, and something you tapped on to me that sort of these soft skills, which is my sort of trigger word of emotional intelligence. It's not a soft skill. I think it's one of the hardest things to, to, to practice, as we all know, in, in the world of uh, emotional intelligence, because we throw in human beings and you know, that's what happens. So how do we sort of really, you know, think about those things that, um, those those lessons that are critical and how we can um, continue to move forward. Thank you for that, Samira. Ali or, or, yes, Ali. So I can go next. And it's interesting because um, Samira, you and I must be vibing <laughs> across the city, wherever we are. Um, because the, you know, when Belinda said what comes to you and what you're inspired to say is what, what would be a takeaway. So I want to very briefly say my grandmother was a, um, my grandmother, Antonieta Jesusa Carhuamaca Alvarado, who was from Juan Manabarca, which is the place of the, the Falcons, the community of the Falcons. And she, um, she was known in the community that she married into, into my grandfather's place she was known um, for just being a really good person, like so sweet, so good. Just one of those people who knows how to live in community, live in a village where there is gossip, there is jealousy, there is trouble, there is, you know, they say, you know, in Spanish, they'll say, um, pueblo chico, infierno grande, you know, small community, big fire, <laughs> um, a lot of drama, you know, but it takes, it takes people who are in that way community minded to coexist. And because if you fight with somebody that fight could be not just between me and you, but then over generations, my children and your children will fight. The grandchildren will fight generate. And then even generations will pass. You don't know what you're angry about, but you just know that although that family is like this. So my grandmother was just known for being kind of like peaceful and tranquil and getting along with folks. And People used to say that she's so generous um, and I'm not trying to edify her, you know, but just to say that um, a simple ordinary woman community member, um, you know, is remembered in this way. And, you know, I remember my cousin who used to harvest the, the potato crops. My grandmother planted corn and potatoes, um, would harvest the potato crops. And my, my cousin said, you know, oh my gosh, she said, cousin, our grandma was so kind. She was so generous, you know, at, during harvest time, all of the, the, the fields are next to each other. So you might be farming with your neighbor and then some other neighbor across the way. And, you know, and she said, you know, our grandmother would see people, um, you know, coming uh, with their with their potatoes and they would be carrying their potatoes and, and harvesting the crop. And she said, you know, and, and my grandmother passed away when I was seven years old. So um, I, I didn't get the chance to, to be with her as much as I could have in the field. And my um, cousin said, you know, she would see people, she would, she would be harvesting her own potatoes, she would see her neighbor, and she would gather the potatoes really quickly into her full, oh, the Getua women wear full skirts, and then they have these big aprons, and she would gather a bunch of potatoes into her apron, and she would run over to that other field, and she would say to the, to the neighbor, 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 you know, what's he must be, what's he must be, like, um, 
I have potatoes, you know, and then she would come back and she said, the people that were farming with my grandmother, our extended family would say, why did you give them potatoes? You know, they're farming their own. <laughs> like they've got potatoes, you've got potatoes, everybody's got potatoes. And my grandmother would say, they have their own, I have my own, but maybe mine are different. Maybe they'll taste different. Maybe they'll give them a good flavor. And I want to use that as a metaphor for knowledge. You know, and I think this really, uh, Samira's story really is um, such a nice compliment. I think we compliment each other because, you know, think of the knowledge that we have. You have your potatoes, I have my potatoes. Folks, plant your potatoes, harvest your potatoes, <laughs> share your potatoes. I, I, I love, now, now that we're gonna be really hungry, so thank you for that, Ellie and grandma. Um, because now I'm thinking about our French fries, uh, but you know how beautiful you know this notion of again when we talk about recentering, it's additive, right? It's not saying your potatoes are bad or your potatoes aren't worth knowing, or your potatoes. Oh, if we do this, we don't have room for your potatoes. There's always room for potatoes, and there's always room for French fries. Love it, um, Saring. Your any any sort of uh, you know last sort of a tip action step for all of us. No, I'm mindful of the time. We do have a minute, but I think that it's the power that we have within ourselves to bring our wisdom, to bring our knowledge to wherever we are. I think that's important. Ten years ago, if you told me that compassion would be something that we would be talking in the corridors of business, in Wall Street or any kind of street, uh, I would say you're bonkers. But it is it is part of company's values and it's being embraced. So I think that we have to bring power to the wisdom that we carry on our shoulders. The second is the concept of interdependence. And I think that cannot be discounted. It's as we deal with climate change, as we deal with emotions, as we deal through this, this inflection moment in, in the world, I think it's important to realize that we are interdependent uh, with each other. Uh, we cannot discount each of our emotions, but how we choose to transform the world as we move forward for ourselves as well as our future generation is something that we have to embrace and as we move forward. So it has been a privilege to be able to share this platform with Samira, Ellie and Belinda and with each one of you, my gratitude. Well, sorry, what a sort of perfect note, um, we didn't rehearse it, but what a great note to end on really this idea of, you know, the concept of compassion, which is what this three day retreat, um, you know, that uh, Six Seconds has afforded us a really a platform to come together, um, you know, and, and uh, really thinking about compassion and that we can't eat our potatoes by ourselves. We can't grow our potatoes by ourselves. So it is absolutely interdependent. Um, and with that, um, we will make sure that this um, recording is uh, available. Um, please do, uh, I think our bios are on, our, on the website. So please do feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'll stick behind for a bit if, if anybody um, would like to, uh, but we really thank you so much for, um, for your time and for your, uh, your compassion, really, to think about how do we uh, expand this, um, you know, the work that we do, because quite honestly, we, we don't have any other choice. Um, so um, thank you for joining us. Good evening. Good morning. It's and I'm sure for everyone's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we will be having potatoes. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, have a wonderful rest of your day and take care, everyone.